Let's get started. Thank you so much for coming out on such a beautiful day. Um, as you know from our schedule, the Center has a number of book events coming um, this spring um, because there are a number of really interesting books in our field. Most of them are deep dives into some of the issues that have plagued us for 14 plus years, among them torture and Guantanamo, and some of them are on foreign policy issues. And the first one on foreign policy issues, I like to say it's a foreign policy issue, it's actually a global security issue, foreign policy issue, is, is David Phillips' book, An Uncertain Ally, Turkey, Turkey Under Erdogan's Dictatorship. Um, I don't know a lot about Turkey, but um, one time when Erdogan came to the Council on Foreign Relations, do you remember this years and years ago? Mm. He tried to sell Turkey as sort of the answer to all the world's problems. This is what I remember, that it was going to be the bridge between East and West, there would never be another issue. So I just want you to know that afterwards, I, we're going to do a little reassessment of that talk. Um, David's been here before, and so I, I've, I've been through his biography before, but what you should know is he, he is an essential voice in understanding not just Turkey, but a number of groups, nations, and people throughout the region that the United States is so deeply embroiled with today. Um, and I think the last time you were here, we were talking about the Kurds. I think. So um, he's affiliated with Columbia, as you know, but he's also done a number of work at universities around the country. He's worked with the UN. He's worked with the State Department. He's worked at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's worked at the Council on Foreign Relations. And there's like a list of 50 of them, but I'm picking the ones that I actually can pronounce and know how to say. So um, we're gonna, he's going to talk for about 20 minutes. Then he and I will have a little discussion, but mostly we're going to open it up to you for discussion because there isn't a lot of good information these days uh, about Turkey other than what comes from, from David, and I think this is our opportunity to ask the questions we'd like to have answered. So, David. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. When you have a long list of affiliations, it's because you can't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> and that's partly because we speak truth to power. So I'm not going to mince any of my words today. I'm going to try to be as direct and forthcoming as I can about the conditions in Turkey and how it affects the region and U.S. interests as well as NATO's interests. Turkey joined NATO in 1952. Uh, Turkish and U.S. troops fought side by side during the Korean conflict. Uh, during the Cold War, Turkey was the eastern front of NATO. Uh, during the Gulf War, Turkey provided sanctuary to Kurds. There's a long history of diplomatic and security cooperation between the U.S. and Turkey. Turkey was a valued and treasured member of NATO. But that was then. Now Turkey is a rogue nation which is actively working to undermine U.S. interests and against NATO's approach in the Middle East. Uh, NATO is much more than a security alliance. It's a country, it's a coalition of countries with shared values. If NATO were established today, because Turkey is Islamist, anti-democratic, anti-American, and against human rights, it simply would not be welcome as a member. This wasn't always the case. When Tayyip Erdogan was elected in 2002, he, the election of the Justice and Development Party was like a breath of fresh air. And I very warmly and enthusiastically welcomed the change in Turkish politics. There were some calcified secular parties who had been in power for many years. Uh, Erdogan challenged them, challenged the status quo. He brought Turkey's economy, which was staggering, back from on its knees to standing, uh, reduced double-digit inflation and high rates of unemployment. Uh, the deep state, a web of security and bureaucratic officials, which had been involved in a crackdown in the Kurdish region, was tamed by Erdogan. The lack of civil rights for Kurds led to the creation of the PKK. When Erdogan came into power, there was a ceasefire announced by the PKK. 
initiated a dialogue with them, um, rescued the economy, built infrastructure, raised living standards. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF negotiated a bailout for Turkey. So there was a lot of positive development early on in Erdogan's rise to the prime ministership. Uh, in recognition of that in 2005, the EU invited Turkey to start accession talks. But there was always this uh, concern about Erdogan's commitment to secularism and to democracy. Uh, in Siirt in 1998, uh, he read a poem, the mosques are our barracks, the domes are helmets, the minarets are bayonets, and the faithful are soldiers. He was convicted to a 10-month prison term for uh, undermining national unity. After the AKP won a smashing election victory in 2002, Erdogan famously pronounced, democracy is like a streetcar. You get off when you've reached your destination. Erdogan directly confronted uh, the military establishment, which was the guardian of Ataturk's legacy of secularism. The tensions between Erdogan and the military increased in 1997 when Erdogan nominated Abdullah Gul, the foreign minister, to become president. Uh, Gul is a devout Muslim. His wife is veiled. The chairman of the Turkish general staff, Yasser Buyukanit, warned of furtive plans that aim to undo modern advances and ruin the Turkish Republic's secular and democratic structure. The Turkish armed forces will not hesitate to make their position clear as absolute defenders of secularism. The military was always um, robust in enforcing secularism, but they proved to be a paper tiger in this instance. Erdogan responded to this challenge and an e-coup by the military, an electronic coup, by calling early elections for July 22, 2007. These elections were swept by the Justice and Development Party. With this mandate, he could have uh, used authority to reform Article 301 of the Penal Code, which makes it a crime to, quote, denigrate Turkishness, or Article 8 of the Anti-Terror Act that is used to limit freedom of expression, or to resolve the Kurdish question. But instead, Tayyip Erdogan focused on new legislation that would allow women to wear the hijab at public universities and in the workplace. To Tayyip Erdogan, human rights are Islamic rights, and he showed that by focusing on the hijab issue. The Turkish Constitutional Court reviewed the law and deemed it unconstitutional. In response to that, Erdogan vowed, we are going to shut down the Constitutional Court. He pushed through constitutional reform, limiting the role of secular institutions and the judiciary, which was ratified in a popular referendum in 2008. There were press reports and initiatives taken to dismantle in the former security institutions. Operation Sledgehammer alleged that active and retired members of the armed forces were trying to foment unrest to justify a coup aimed at restoring peace and stability. There was also a uh, case called Ergenicon in which hundreds of security officials were arrested and held in administrative detention for years without any kind of conviction. So how did Tayyip Erdogan, who started as a reformer, uh, always a populist, turn into a despot? We look at 2013 as a turning point in Erdogan's evolution. Uh, this was the year that Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood was removed by General Abdel al-Sisi in Egypt. He was convicted in a show trial and sentenced to death. Well, Erdogan and Morsi had a sense of kinship, of fraternity. 
Erdogan believed that Morsi's removal was a U.S. Zionist plot and that he would be next. At the same time, there was a broad popular uprising in Gezi Park in Istanbul. This is a green park area. There were plans to build a shopping center there. And Turks came out in large numbers to protest. This protest spread to 60 cities. It was not so much a protest about green space in Istanbul. It was a protest about the government increasingly limiting freedom of expression and political participation. On May 30th of 2013, the protesters in Gezi Park were dispersed violently. The police were accused of uh, brutality. Erdogan responded to that with an intense crackdown on social media. Uh, he targeted so-called provocateurs. Facebook and Twitter was banned. There was scant media coverage of the Gezi Park protest itself. Turkish national television broadcast a documentary about penguins as the police were rolling through the park and um, removing the protesters. On the 17th of December 2013, a huge corruption scandal erupted. The police detained 52 people with ties to the AKP. Four ministers were forced to resign. The prosecutors accused 14 of bribery, corruption, fraud, and money laundering. There were wiretaps that recorded Erdogan talking to his son Bilal on the morning of this uh, poli police action. Uh, he instructed Bilal to get rid of cash in the family homes. Erdogan said, whatever you have in the home, I'm telling you to get rid of it. Later in the day, Bilal called his father and said, I still have 30 million euros that I can't dispose of. <laughs> Erdogan proposed giving it to a, a wealthy real estate developer and buying some high-end apartments on the Bosphorus. In fact, those apartments were transacted later in the day. Uh, Bilal Erdogan has a sordid reputation. In addition to alleged ties with ISIS, he was also prosecuted by the Bologna police for bringing $1 billion in suitcases into the country for the purposes of money laundering. The other thing that happened in 2013 was the war in Syria. Uh, President Obama had declared a red line on the use of CW. When he refused to enforce the red line in defense of Sunni Arabs, Erdogan was incensed, and he launched a systematic operation to support jihadis, including members of the Islamic State. Turkey institutionalized its support through the jihadi highway. Weapons, money, and logistics were conveyed from Sanli Urfa to Raqqa, the head of the Islamic State. Vice President Joe Biden said at an address in Harvard, our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks, Saudis, the Emiratis were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a Sunni-Shia proxy war, they poured hundreds of millions of dollars into anyone who would fight against Assad. Of course, Erdogan responded to this with fury he said, unless Biden retracts the statement, I'm through with Joe. There was a systematic cover-up. There was a law passed that made it illegal to report on any of the jihadi highway activities. John Dundar, the editor-in-chief of Jum Hurriyet, was sentenced to five years for reporting on the National Intelligence Agency's shipment of weapons to Islamists. According to Dundar, the sentence not only is given to suppress and silence us, but to intimidate the Turkish media and make us scared of writing. I'll note here that today there are more journalists in jail in Turkey than in any other country. Also in 2013 was the battle for Kobani. Kobani is a Syrian Kurdish town 
on the border with Turkey. About 80% of Kobani was taken by the Islamic State, and Kurds from across the region, including Kurds from Turkey, rushed to their rescue, rushed to help. Erdogan responded by sealing the border and not allowing them to enter. Turkish tanks were parked on the hillside behind Kobani, where the international media observed the battle. Initially, uh, the U.S. determined that it didn't have a strategic interest in what would happen in Kobani. But it changed that position and decided to provide air support and to airlift weapons to the heroic defenders of, Ko of Kobani, who were the People's Protection Units, the Syrian Kurds, also members of the PKK, Pajak, which is the Iranian Kurdish group, and Peshmerga from Iraqi Kurdistan. The U.S. expanded its security cooperation with the YPG, supporting the liberation of Talabyad, an important city on the transit route between Turkey and Raqqa. To all of this, Erdogan responded with deep rage, insisting that the PYD and its military affiliate, the YPG, were mere extensions of the PKK and saying you can't fight a terrorist group by supporting another terrorist group. Well, I was a strong advocate for U.S. action in Kobani. I was very pleased when the U.S. decided to put its foot in the ground and get more involved. Supporting the YPG and its affiliated militias, including the PKK, was the right thing to do. It was also the right thing to do when we think about U.S. security interests. On the 22nd of July, there was an attack in a town called Suruj on the border. There were 33 kills, uh, Kurds killed that day. A radical faction of the PKK, uh, the Falcons, launched a strike against the police in Suruj, who they believed were accomplices in the attack. In response to that, Erdogan launched a massive counterattack against the PKK, bombing their installations in the Kandil Mountains in northern Iraq, hitting their facilities in southeastern Turkey. He essentially restarted Turkey's civil war with the Kurds in a blatant effort to rally his nationalist base uh, and to show that Turkey would not stand idly by when attacked by so-called terrorists. This was also an effort to distract Turks from Turkey's failing economy. The Turkish lira, which a year ago was trading at two lira to the dollar, is now trading at almost four lira to the dollar. Turkey has a huge debt. Servicing the debt at that exchange rate is extremely burdensome. Part of the reason why the AKP enjoyed such support involved its ability to preserve Turkey's robust economic growth, even during the 2008 global recession. So restarting the civil war with Kurds was an attempt to distract Kurdish, Turkish citizens from the reality of their life in Turkey. There were elections in Turkey on June 7th. For the first time since Erdogan's rise, the AKP's support actually reduced, and it reduced dramatically. They won just a little bit north of 40% of the vote. Uh, Erdogan obstructed the creation of a new coalition government, scheduled new elections, and in the interest of stability, he appealed to Turks, saying that he was the only one who could solve their problems. I remember Ambassador Richard Holbrook, with whom I worked at the State Department, speaking about Slobodan Milosevic, that he would, so he would create a problem that only he could solve. Well, Erdogan took a page from that playbook. And when there were new elections on November 1, he, in fact, won 49% of the vote. Uh, he upped the ante, doubling down on the 15th of September by invading and occupying Syria. Turkish forces went into Jarablus, 
Everyone thought there would be a big battle there, but the Muslim extremists in Jerablus merely changed their garb, shaved their beards, there was no fight, they welcomed Turkey to come on in. So where do we stand now? Uh, 2016 was a little bit of a comeback year for Tayyip Erdogan. Because of his election performance on November 1, uh, he now is controlling the government. His goal is to establish an executive presidency, to rewrite the Constitution in order to consolidate his powers. And there will be a referendum on the 16th of April in which Turks will have a chance to go to the polls and determine if they want to validate an, a dictatorship with Tayyip Erdogan in control and able to stay in office for another dozen years. Uh, Turkey's invasion and occupation of Syria was also a little bit of a game changer. The Kurds in Syria had established a contiguous territory in the provinces of Afrin, Kobani, and Jazeera. Uh, this buffer along the Turkish-Syria border is abhorrent to Erdogan because it's the first step in the creation of an independent Kurdish state in Syria. Just like Turkey has had a reflexive rejection of self-rule in Iraqi Kurdistan, Erdogan responded very negatively to the possibility of Syrian Kurds enjoying the same. And then, of course, at the end of 2016, the best stroke of luck for Erdogan was the election of President Donald Trump. In many ways, their personalities are similar. Mr. Trump's initial national security advisor, General Michael Flynn, published an editorial on Election Day in which he called for the extradition of Fatula Gulen, who engineered, who allegedly engineered the coup of July 15. He also called for the U.S. to abandon its support to the Syrian Kurds and to hitch its wagon with the Turkish armed forces. On the 7th of February, uh, Trump and Erdogan had their first phone call. The call was marked by high hopes and mutual admiration. According to the White House, they discussed their, quote, shared commitment to combating terrorism in all its forms. Trump reiterated U.S. support to Turkey as a strategic partner and a NATO ally, and he welcomed Turkey's contributions to the campaign against the Islamic State. They avoided speaking about um, difficult issues. Trump didn't criticize Erdogan for mass arrests and dismissals that followed the coup of July 15. And let me just note for the record, in response to the coup, Erdogan dismissed or fired from their jobs 140,000 people, police, military, professors. They are alleged to have been involved with Fatula Gulen or to have participated in the coup. He reacted quickly after the coup on July 15th, which led to a widespread speculation that Erdogan was actually complicit with the coup. I don't believe that was the case, but I do believe that the coup plotters were discovered. Erdogan let it go just far enough so it was credible, and then he cracked down hard including using these lists of so-called oppositionists to uh, issue orders for mass arrests and to undermine any kind of effective political opposition. By the same token that Trump didn't criticize Erdogan for the uh, heavy-handed response to the coup, Erdogan didn't mention Trump's Muslim ban on travel to the United States. They apparently found common ground and joked about the media in their countries, with Erdogan praising Trump for putting a reporter, quote, in his place during a news conference the day before. Vice President Mike Pence subsequently called Turkey's Prime Minister Yildirim promising a, quote, new era in U.S.-Turkey relations. 
So despite this um, surface level support and camaraderie, substantive rapprochement between the U.S. and Turkey is going to be much more problematic. Erdogan has specifically drawn some red lines. He demands that the U.S. extradite Fethullah Gulen. What he doesn't realize is that the U.S. rules around extradition do not involve political choice. It's strictly a legal matter. The U.S. Justice Department uh, under Senator Sessions is going to review the materials and make a decision whether or not they are strong enough to merit extradition. Even if Senator, even if uh, Jeff Sessions recommends extradition, a U.S. federal court still must decide, and Gulen can contest extradition. If he loses, he can appeal. This process is likely to take months, if not years. Erdogan wants Trump to reject Pentagon proposals to arm Kurdish fighters in Syria. The YPG, the People's Protection Units, have essentially been America's boots on the ground when it comes to fighting ISIS in Syria. Uh, there are about 40,000 YPG members who are battle-hardened. They're part of something called the Syrian Democratic Forces. There are some Arab fighters mixed into the SDF, but it is really largely a Syrian Kurdish uh, army. Uh, there are several options on the table. Trump has asked uh, the Pentagon to give him a plan to, quote, utterly destroy ISIS. He could so ally himself with Damascus and with Russia. The U.S. could ally itself with Turkey and the Free Syrian Army. Or it could continue its close security cooperation with Syrian Kurds who have acted to date as the point of the spear and show themselves to have enormous metal in the, in the fight against ISIS. The plan to destroy ISIS is due tomorrow. So we'll see what General Mattis comes up with. I think it'll probably be some kind of a hybrid proposal where we continue to work with the YPG while giving token lip service to the U.S.-Turkey security partnership as members of NATO. But the battle for Raqqa is only one element. President Trump has also promised, quote, big, beautiful safe zones in Syria. Now, there may be a more easily established safe zone along the border with Jordan, but if there's a safe zone to be created on the Turkish-Syrian border, how is that going to be enforced? The Turkish armed forces, depleted from the crackdown after the, uh, the coup of July 15, hasn't shown battlefield prowess. Without telling the U.S., they moved from Jarablus, launched an attack against a town called Al-Bab. They've essentially been bogged down in Al-Bab. Almost 100 Turkish special forces have been killed there. And keep in mind, that Turkey is not a reliable antagonist with the Islamic State because the Islamic State benefited from Turkey's patronage and there are personal relationships between leaders of the TSK, the Turkish Armed Forces, and ISIS itself. Apparently the Pentagon is very keen to continue its cooperation with the Kurds the political actors in the White House are more prone to placate Turkey. We'll see what kind of a decision Mr. Trump comes up with. He's even raised the idea of U.S. ground forces. In my view, this would be an attempt to mollify Turkey's concerns about extensive cooperation between the U.S. and Syrian Kurds. And the idea that American men and women would be put in harm's way in order to placate Ankara's views, to me, is absolutely abhorrent, especially when you need and have a local ground force already in place, which is able to do the job. If the YPG is given the role of enforcing a safe zone, Ankara is going to push back hard on that proposition. They're going to view that as a U.S. sanctuary, 
and pit stop on the path to independence, much the way the U.S. protected the Iraqi Kurds and have allowed them to move towards de facto independence, which will be a de jure declaration of independence, in my view, within a year's time. There's also the question about a political settlement for Syria, which will have enormous impact in Turkey and on U.S.-Turkey relations. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, proposed on the 27th of January a draft constitution, which included restrictions on the power of Syria's presidency, with most powers deferred to a parliament and a newly created assembly of regions. There's a provision in this draft constitution that stipulates equal rights between Kurds and Arabs in Syria. Russia also invited discussion allowing for, quote, autonomy of Kurdish regions. This is a step towards federalization, and federalization, in Erdogan's view, is a step towards fragmentation and ultimately towards independence. So if Russia endorses this peace plan and the U.S. aligns itself with Moscow, as the Trump White House is prone to do, there will be a serious blowback from Ankara. So Trump is facing some hard choices in an environment where there are shifting alliances. It wouldn't be the first time that the U.S. has sold out the Kurds. We did that in 1975 with the Algiers Accord. President George H.W. Bush urged the Kurds to rise up against Saddam in 1991 and then left them without support. Given the fact that the Kurds have been our best allies in Syria, to me, it would be a gross injustice to have asked them to shed blood on our behalf and then leave them to the mercy of a Turkish reprisal. And there's nothing that the U.S. would abhor more than being caught in the middle of a conflict in Syria between the Turkish army and the YPG. That will again force us to take sides. So here we are at a crossroads. Uh, President Erdogan has shown himself to be uh, a supporter of ISIS, an Islamist at his core. His mass arrests of oppositionists proves his undemocratic credentials. And the crackdown on independent media, I'm sure there's a term in Turkish for fake news. <laughs> is also emblematic of uh, the trends that exist in Turkey. So the U.S. is going to have to make some choices. It's going to have to assess whether Turkey is reliable. Given President Trump's predilections, I fear that he will align himself with Turkey and with Russia in Syria, that the U.S. will turn a blind eye to the gross pattern of human rights violations occurring in Turkey, and then people like myself, who are advocates for human rights, will have to raise their voices even louder in opposition, not only to what's happening in Turkey, but to what's happening in the United States. So we're at a fork in the road. Uh, we need to make some difficult decisions. The timing of my book couldn't be better because it highlights all these critical issues. And I'm going to do whatever I can to use the book as a calling card for a discussion about U.S. interests and how we should view Turkey and our other allies in the region. So I greatly welcome Karen's invitation to join you today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you all. Okay, so, so to sum up, you're worried, correct? All right, so I want to ask you a couple of uh, quite First of all, thank you so much. And I think you should change the title. It didn't sound to me like you thought they were an uncertain ally. It sounded to me like you thought they were not an ally. Just saying that. I, I selected the title six months ago. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, right? If sounds gonna, to me like. If I were going to title it today. Yeah. 
it would be, we have, we'd have a stronger choice of words. Uh-huh. That's what I was thinking. Okay. So, um, I just want to talk about just a few things and then make sure that there's time for questions. But the first thing is, you referred to the deep state of Turkey. Um, you know, the deep state is something that's being used by uh, the media and experts to talk about whatever battles going on in Washington right now. Um, and what I'm really, I guess the real question here about Erdogan, and I refer to that time when he came and talked about he was going to be the bridge between East and West over this, you know, flourishing democratic order, is, and you say, okay, he changed. And, you know, you talk about the Muslim Brotherhood and, and what happened in Egypt. But do you think he changed? Or do you think he was deceitful from the beginning? I'm just curious. When you look at his early quotes about um, the role of Islam, which brought him into detention yeah. because of the speech he gave in Seert, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's fairly revealing about where he's coming from. The idea that democracy is a streetcar, you get off when you reach your destination, mm -hmm. also um, is something he said early in his term. So your point is well taken. From the beginning, Erdogan was an Islamist and an anti-democrat. He embraced human rights because the EU required it as part of their candidacy negotiations. And he used it as a way of targeting Turkey's administrative state and consolidating his power. The administrative state that is referred to in the United States is a bit different than the deep state as it's used in Turkey. In Turkey, it's a security establishment of military and police yeah. that use their positions of power and privilege to uh, make money and to consolidate their gains. The administrative state here uh, is uh, not something that's run by the Pentagon or by the police. It's something that Trump envisions as a liberal, progressive cabal against his own interests. But fundamentally, they are similar. And fundamentally, our response is progressives needs to be the same. We have to push back on all fronts. That's interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you to talk a little more widely about Turkey's destabilizing role in the world at large. You know, you focused your comments on Syria, you referred to Russia and the United States, but what about the rest of the region and the sort of simmering war that's going on in so many countries and which the United States and Russia um, seem to be embroiled? Is, is Turkey a game changer or are they just one of many players? So Turkey was always viewed as a bridge between Europe and the Muslim world, mm -hmm. uh, particularly to Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Erdogan, in fact, has pursued a neo-Ottoman agenda, trying to reestablish for Turkey spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. And he's done that by promoting Islamism. I just came back from the Western Balkans. And all the countries there, Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia, all are suffering from Turkey's neo-imperial agenda. Uh, they're doing it under the guise of rebuilding Ottoman architecture. But in fact, they're bringing in suitcases full of cash to be dispersed by TICA, its development agency, which is used to finance madrasas and to support local imams who are radicalizing the local population. So Turkey's agenda around the world is to restore its Ottoman influence. And it's using Islamism as the wedge to divide countries from the West. This is also not good news. Um, uh, because you could see spheres of influence. I mean, Russia is now declaring its spheres of influence, right? Turkey's, you know, larger Turkey, larger Russia. A couple of other countries are talking this way. I mean, that's kind of a, um, a rethinking about the, about the world order. Or, or looking back at the world order the way it used to be in the maybe 19th century. So that's a little bit frightening, right? So I um, had the opportunity to meet and get to know Marty Adesari, who was the negotiator of the Kosovo yeah. Agreement. And Marty made a very important statement. He said that Milosevic lost his credible claim 
to govern Kosovo because of the pattern of gross human rights abuses. Yeah. Now, I've always thought that the solution for the Kurds lay in reforms for Turkey, greater political and cultural rights. But given the fact that the European Parliament has voted to suspend Turkey's negotiations mm -hmm. on membership, and there's no prospect for the Kurds to benefit from a rising tide that lifts all boats mm -hmm. in Turkey, I finally am coming to the point where I believe that the southeastern parts of Turkey mm -hmm. need to disassociate themselves from Turkey itself. Mm -hmm. The move towards independence and self-determination may provoke greater violence, mm -hmm. or it may have a moderating effect on elements in the military and the security structures. But clearly, the status quo isn't working. You have cities like Jizre in the southeast, Kurdish cities, that have been totally decimated. They're worse than Aleppo. You have hundreds of thousands of Kurdish refugees from the southeast who have been driven from their homes. So the current condition uh, isn't in Turkey's interest. It clearly is making Turkey an outlier state from Europe. So that it's unsustainable. Is the U.S. going to align itself with an Islamist, anti-American regime? Or are we going to find the victims and the Democrats in the region and support them more strongly? In my view, that starts with a recognition of independence from Iraqi Kurdistan and mm -hmm. support for federalism mm -hmm. and confederation in Rojava, mm -hmm. which are the provinces in Syria where Kurds predominate. Mm -hmm. So very briefly, and then we're, I'm going to take your questions, um, or David's going to take your questions, actually. Um, the, the, you've done a little bit work on, on thinking about um, counter-extremism. And so you describe sort of this outreach to the Islamist mindset and to recruitment worldwide. But um, how effective are any of the efforts to counter that, either by state-sponsored groups or by independent um, global agencies? So that's a whole sphere of uh, activity. I mean, let me just summarize some of the key points. Mm -hmm. It's widely viewed that uh, greater education and economic development are antidotes to extremism. Yeah. The U.S. Institute for Peace has recently done a study that concludes the opposite, that those factors are not considerable. When you have an outside party like Turkey, which is actively stirring the pot, it's hard to have an antidote for extremism. When Turkey is providing money and weapons and logistical support to the Islamic State, it's hard for Turkey to credibly present itself as a U.S. security partner mm -hmm. in our stated goal of destroying the Islamic State. So you need a combination of soft power, mm -hmm. uh, which involves human rights and democratic governance, and then the mm, development tools that the U.S. Institute for Peace discards, but which are nonetheless important. Mm -hmm. But in the short term, you need to have hard power. Mm -hmm. If somebody is wearing a suicide vest and is about to launch an attack, you're not going to organize a democracy workshop and try to convince them to change their behavior. You need to respond to that with a security measure. So I support enhanced security targeting extremists. But if you're going to defeat extremism and drain the swamp, that's a generational endeavor. And that's going to take better governance, improved human rights conditions, and then an amelioration of the living conditions that give rise to frustration and isolation. So I guess we should have had you back tomorrow when we can read uh, Mattis's strategy, on, right? Uh, I'm sure I'll be responding to Mattis's strategy. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, we'll be watching. We'll put it out in the brief. Uh, so your questions. Yes. Can you identify yourself, please? Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could identify the proposed changes to the governmental structure, like the, the, the new presidential system that he's proposing that would help him in consolidating power. 
So the executive presidency that Erdogan is proposing uh, would essentially eliminate checks and balances in Turkey. Uh, powers would be consolidated with the executive. Uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly would become a rubber stamp for executive decisions. The office of the prime minister, which is now central to governance in Turkey, would continue to exist, but really with symbolic value only. And the attack on the judiciary that started with the constitutional reforms of 2008 have undermined judicial independence. So the judiciary today does not function as, an, as a credible arrest on executive power. Uh, there is already a de facto executive presidency in Turkey. The referendum on April 16th would legally establish Turkey as an imperial state with Erdogan as its dictator, able to serve two consecutive presidential terms of six years each. So Erdogan isn't going away. And with these new constitutional tools, he'll be able to deflect criticism from the United States and Western countries. So it's a very dangerous step. I don't see any way that Erdogan is going to allow the referendum to fail. Uh, one of the things he's done is to arrest 11 Kurdish deputies as a way of undermining his opposition. So he's shown that he'll do whatever it takes to get rid of community-based or political organizations that stand in his way. So Erdogan often talks about counterterrorism and fighting against extremism. In fact, if you did a side-by-side -side parallel of statements that Erdogan is making and Trump is making, you'd see a remarkable similarity. He talks at great length about the PKK and the need to destroy them. What we've seen now in 40 years of civil war in Turkey that has led to the deaths of 40,000 people, there is no security solution to the Kurdish question. Uh, if he wants to eradicate Kurdish extremism, the only way he's going to do that is through increased democratic reforms and more cultural rights. And there's nothing in Erdogan's character that has shown a willingness to compromise or to be flexible. If anything, he's proven a willingness to double down on his own state-sponsored terrorism when he's challenged. More questions, Alexandra? Thank you. I'm Alexandra Starr. I was wondering if you could comment on how the migrant crisis has impacted Erdogan's relationship with Europe and how perhaps he's exploited it to his benefit. So there are 2.7 million refugees uh, mostly from Syria in Turkey. Uh, they were integrated into society or in camps. And then suddenly, 18 months ago, we saw a sudden spasm of refugee flows. You know, how did that happen? Why did they suddenly decide that they wanted sanctuary in Europe? In my view, it was an event manipulated by Erdogan in order to demonstrate to the EU, Turkey's indispensable role. So they negotiated a deal, uh, the EU-Turkey deal on refugees and migration, which effectively stemmed the population flow, but was never really fully implemented. It involved a swap where refugees would be returned from Greece to Turkey for every refugee returned a refugee would be allowed to go to Europe. There was a big payout promised by the EU. Uh, but the deal never really worked. Although the crisis that we saw in the summer of 2015 has somewhat abated. I don't think the crisis would have happened unless Erdogan was colluding to create conditions, contributing to the, the, the desire of refugees to leave. And he's effectively held the EU hostage because more than a million 
Syrian refugees packed their bags and went up the Balkan human corridor from Greece to Macedonia until borders were closed. There are a million refugees that have been absorbed in Germany. It's already giving rise to the Alternative for Germany Party, the rise of populist political actors in Europe is a direct response to the migrant crisis. And just as Vladimir Putin has tried to engineer dissolution of the EU, I view Erdogan playing a similar role, looking for a payout and trying to benefit politically from Europe's disunity. I'm not sure that Europe ever wanted Turkey to be a member no. of the EU. Do you think Turkey still wants to be a member of the EU? So it's, uh, no. I can answer that question easily. Um, but it's also because the EU has shifted the goalposts and made it difficult. But Turkey is not um, on its face European. You know, with the influx of several million Syrians who are being given Turkish passports, Turkey is becoming increasingly <coughs> Arabized and, and Islamicized. It serves Erdogan's purpose to stay in the queue, but there's little prospect that Turkey is going to make headway. Uh, it's a politically convenient maneuver, but Turkey is not going to make any progress anytime soon. Uh, more questions in the back and then over here. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Jim Fitzsimmons is my name. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is about the safe zones. Uh, given the shifting alliances, the chaotic situation in that regard, uh, do you see any possibility for successful safe zones, and how would that come about? And thanks for your question, Jim. Uh, safe zones provide a place for refugees to return. Uh, they also serve as a headquarters for an opposition administration in Syria. But safe zones only work if the U.S. is prepared to enforce them. And from a military perspective, to have a safe zone, you have to neutralize uh, air power of Syria and Russia. It means you have to take down uh, their uh, surface-to-air missile capabilities. And you need fighters on the ground who are going to provide safety and security. If Turkey has already conspired with the Islamic State that's present in these areas, is it going to be capable of actually enforcing a safe zone? In my view, the answer is no. If the U.S. wants to have a safe zone and it elects to provide the Syrian Kurds with the capacity to enforce one, that's going to prompt a huge blowback from Ankara, and there will be a political price to pay. So here again, I think we have another example. You know, President Trump is talking about policy without envisioning the commitments that are required to implement policy. I support a safe zone administered and enforced by Syrian Kurds and a federal solution to Syria that would devolve power from Damascus to the regions with asymmetrical authority given to the Syrian Kurds who have deserved it because of their sacrifice of uh, troops and treasure. Whether the U.S. is prepared to stand behind that, we will see. General Mattis in the Pentagon knows full well that the Syrian Kurds are America's best allies on the ground. The political actors in the White House want to find a way of keeping Turkey happy. I just don't think you can do those things at the same time. I think ultimately you have to choose your allies. You talked about shifting alliances. And Turkey is no longer what it was during NATO's heyday. You know, it's actively undermined U.S. efforts against ISIS. And it would be a mistake for the U.S. to align itself now with Turkey at a critical juncture in the fight against ISIS. Um, my question is about Turkey and Israel and the supposedly uh, new relationship. Uh, 
What do you think the 2017 and 2018 will look like, and will Trump in try to influence that relationship? So keep in mind that the uh, relationship with Turkey and Israel had, had been good until 2008 when a ship called the Mavi Marmara, launched by a Turkish foundation, set sail on a humanitarian convoy to Gaza. Uh, the ship was warned not to enter Israeli uh, waters. It was ultimately prevented from doing so. There were eight Turks on board, including one U.S. citizen, who were killed in the operation. In response, Turkey broke its diplomatic relations with Israel. Erdogan said some things that were deeply hateful towards Israel, which I believe reveal his true feelings. As part of the normalization of Turkey's relations with Russia and with Israel, there has been in the past six months some steps taken in a positive direction. But that improvement in relations is purely transactional. It doesn't reflect any deeply rooted change of heart or a different view. It's merely a decision that Turkey made to try to restore relations with key allies in the region. And just as the transaction enabled things to move forward, things can move back just as easily unless at its core the relationship is improved, and it hasn't. Wait for the microphone. Okay. Uh, Raymond Knowles. That's terrible. Uh, how deep is Mr. Erdogan's bench? In other words, if you were no longer on the scene, would, it, would anything change? The bench is pretty shallow. All right, okay. you know, Erdogan has a son-in-law who is the energy minister, who has an enormous amount of power. His son Bilal is also deeply influential. Erdogan essentially marginalized or removed all of the leading Turkish politicians who could oppose him. It was viewed that Abdullah Gul would end up becoming prime minister in a swap with Erdogan. That didn't happen. Ahmet Davidolu became prime minister. He was widely criticized for being Erdogan's lapdog, but that wasn't good enough. He too was removed. Another founding member of the AKP, Bulent Orange, spoke in opposition to Erdogan's policy towards the Kurds, and he was also marginalized. So the inner core of the AKP no longer exists. Uh, Erdogan surrounded himself with family members and ass kissers who tell him that uh, he's doing good. So there is very little alternative. People rightly raised questions about the coup of July 15, had it succeeded, would that have led to a civil war in Turkey? Erdogan has cultivated a base of support in the Anatolian heartland and among Islamists. So much like the United States, Turkey is a uh, deeply divided society. Uh, Erdogan has um, used politics of fear and division in order to justify the consolidation of his power. And it's hard to walk that back when you've when you've already brought the situation to the brink, as he has. Last question. Hi, uh, Steph D. Sai. It seems clear um, that you're saying the U.S. will have to make a choice at some point, either doubling down on supporting the Syrian Kurds and the YPG or continuing its security cooperation with Turkey. Um, I wonder how vital that security relationship is. I've, I've been at Incirlik, the air base. Um, I know it was, it's a strategic air base and it's important, but what about on intel issues and other military issues? How vital um, is that relationship? So there are two sides of the security cooperation. One is the military cooperation. The other, as you point out, has to do with intelligence. Now, Turkey is an important listening post and intelligence gathering ground for what's happening in Iran. Uh, that is an important factor about which those of us without current security clearances are not well informed, but it is a very important factor that we can't underestimate. On the security side, now Turkey always threatens to withdraw its agreement to allow U.S. warplanes to use in Chirlik. 
In my view, let that happen. There is an air base in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, there are facilities in Cyprus. There are bases in Jordan. If the U.S. wants to diversify its portfolio, it can continue to fight against ISIS in the region without the use of Inchirlik. And I just don't think that we should be held hostage by Turkey for the use of an air base. Uh, but the nature of the relationship between U.S., the United States, and Turkey isn't so much about security issues, it's about values. I mean, Turks and Americans are close friends. I have many friends in Turkey, most of whom have been dismissed from their jobs. Every day I receive a note from someone I don't know pleading for help because they've been fired or they have a family member who's in jail. So sadly, you know, the close relationship between Americans and Turks has been wounded by Erdogan's policies. Uh, I spoke with a former U.S. ambassador about what to do to put the reform process back on track in Turkey. And to my amazement, his response was, we should assassinate him. I've never heard a former U.S. official say anything like that. So short of assassination, I think there is a recognition that Turkey cannot succeed with Erdogan as its executive. The country will continue to be radicalized. U.S. interests in the region will continue to be ill-served. We, we need to pursue actively a policy of regime change through non-military measures. Turkey's economy is a bubble that could be burst. Once that happens, I think Turks will recognize that Erdogan has sold them a bill of goods. And then Turks themselves might stand in opposition to the tyranny and dictatorship under which they now live. So there's this election, right? There's, is there going to be an election? There's a, there is a referendum on the constitutional right. reform. And so you don't see any hope there. So they had a vote in the parliament. Right. Uh, a friend of mine who is a deputy with the CHP lost her arm and leg in a train accident. She opposed the referendum. When she got up to speak in opposition from the floor of the parliament, she was attacked by other deputies, and they ripped her prosthetics off her body and then laughed at her while she lay on the ground. Wow. So this is an example of the deplorable situation that currently exists in Turkey, where this level of civility is lost yeah. and the need for more humanity and a more proactive role by the United States. If we can't speak honestly and forthrightly to our friends, then we've lost our influence around the world. Um, this, so we're going to end here. Just a couple of, of you know, thoughts. Uh, w and I think the main takeaway is that this, the Western institutions are really under attack in a way that well, we see it with Russia, um, big time. I mean that you know that uh, that Putin's goal ostensibly is really not the United States. You know his antagonist is not the United States. It's NATO. It's the EU. It's Western institutions, which is how you've described the Turkish uh, uh, tensions right right now. And I think. That's sort of a big takeaway and something we should all reflect on. Um, so everybody should read this book. You should buy it. You can have it autographed. Um, and then when he changes the title, you'll have the one with the original title. And it'll be, it'll be good. Um, we will uh, put this up online. We will continue to follow you and your reactions to Mattis in particular and his you know, how to defeat ISIS uh, in the morning brief, which if you don't get our morning uh, roundup of national security news, let, let us know out there and we'll add you to our list. Just want to say one thing about David Phillips that you can take away from you. He's been doing this for a very long time. But I have to say, I am so incredibly impressed by the calmness with which you deliver a, a semi-hysterical inducing message. <laughs> and I'm going to learn from you. So thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Karen.